Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Rahul Sharma, and joined by my esteemed co-moderator, Dr. Gugan Singh, and our um, expert panelists. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, um, all right, well, without further ado, we'll get started. Um, we have uh, Dr. Mustafa Ab Abdrabu, I hope I didn't uh, mess that up too badly, uh, who's going to talk to us uh, about TAVI using TE guidance. Welcome. Uh, thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, uh, my name is Mustafa Abdrabu. I am a specialist of uh, adult cardiology at Cairo University and Al Nas Hospital. I came here from Egypt. Okay. Uh, I have none, uh, none to disclose. Uh, my, case, my case today is about a 73-year-old female patient uh, who is morbidly obese. She is diabetic with bilateral osteoarthritis, uh, chronic kidney disease. Her baseline creatinine was 2.5. Uh, she, had, she had to be known with severe aortic stenosis for five years with multiple admissions with decompensated heart failure. Uh, she presented to us with acute pulmonary edema. She was admitted uh, at our facility. Uh, then a heart team discussion was done and she was rejected by uh, the surgeons. Uh, as you can see, her uh, risk scores are a bit elevated. <coughs> so, uh, uh, we plan to proceed with TAVI. However, we had a problem with uh, contrast. The patient was rejecting uh, the risk of contrast, so uh, CT and geography was aborted. So our plan was going for using uh, transthoracic echocardiography and transesophageal echocardiography for guidance of valve size and aortic root measurements, uh, using, using a Doppler ultrasound for uh, access site evaluation. Uh, chronic angiography in the same settings, uh, and using real-time TEE monitoring for uh, monitoring the procedure all through and checking the result. Uh, so this is our transthoracic echo. Uh, uh, you can see that the patient has severe calcific aortic stenosis. Uh, the annulus measurement was 2.4. Uh, there was severe aortic, mean gradient was 44, the aortic valve area was one uh, centimeter square, the annulus is 2.4 using uh, 2D T TTE. Dupl the duplex showed uh, an adequate uh, size of the femoral arteries bilaterally. Uh, then uh, on the day uh, of the operation, we started by transesophageal, 4D transesophageal uh, echocardiography uh, using the easy valve software. Uh, after that, this is the model uh, which is given to be adjusted by uh, the operator. Uh, and this is the result of, uh, of, uh, of the study. Uh, we found that the uh, area derived diameter uh, was 23.7 and the perimeter of 75 uh, centimeter. Uh, the coronary height is, was adequate based on these readings. Uh, so at this point, uh, we went for uh, sizing. Uh, we had three options based on these readings. Uh, so we choose the uh, Evolute R29 uh, as it gives us uh, a reading in between the recommended range. Uh, uh, what we use, we, we actually went for uh, coronary angiography. Uh, on the same day, there were no significant coronary artery disease. Uh, uh, for, de for deployment, we, uh, we usually use uh, pre-dilatation uh, pre in these cases, as we don't have uh, a very good uh, idea about the extensive calcification related to the annulus. Uh, then uh, the valve was deployed uh, in a very, a very uh, usual fashion. Um, this is uh, our final uh, result by uh, TEE. We, we ended the study with a trivial uh, paravalvular leak, and we used uh, a total volume of 20 cc's uh, of contrast, and patient was discharged after 48 hours. Uh, based on this data, we uh, collected patients, and we published uh, one month ago uh, the, 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 the agreement between uh, 4D derived uh, aortic uh, diameters and uh, multi detector CT uh, for these patients. However, our patient who went for TAVI of uh, this cohort uh, till now are four to five uh, cases. Uh, 
and we hope to uh, publish, publish this data when we get this. So our key, learning, uh, key learnings for the operator and the team for DTE can be used in planning for TAVI as alternative to CT when it is refused or uh, contraindicated. Uh, for the co-planner or cusp overlap view, you should use uh, uh, the following the right cusp uh, if you don't have CT. Uh, for the peripheral system, you can use dry CT or uh, duplex ultrasound. Uh, we use dry CT in, in few cases, however, uh, in, this, in, the, in that particular case, we proceeded with uh, duplex ultrasound. Uh, you should always uh, consider the general anesthesia risk when you are putting, uh, when you are planning to use for DTE. Uh, thank you, or shukran in Arabic. Thank you. Great job, great case. Uh, any questions from our panel? A great case, thank you so much. Uh, for the software that you used to measure the annulus and the coronary heights, was that automatic or was that on the cart or in real time? How, how was that made? Uh, okay, we can get to that. Uh, it is a semi, some sort of a semi-automated uh, fashion. They have a, a static and a dynamic models. You get your readings uh, multiple times. However, uh, the trick re um, uh, remains in getting the smallest volume uh, while uh, taking the data set to keep uh, the image as sharp as possible. If you get a, a larger volume, the, the images will be, uh, the, the numbers will not be rep reproduced in multiple times. We don't take one reading, we usually take five or six readings uh, and get, uh, if they are concordant, we can proceed. If we not, if it is not, uh, we get it again. We get it again with the CT or try it again. Any other questions, comments? Huh? Thank you. Thank you. All right, great presentation. Um, our next uh, uh, presentation is by Anu Masif, uh, and the presentation is the feasibility of performing transcatheteric valve intervention when no feasible access is available. Dun, dun, dun. Good evening, everyone. I'm Anu, one of third year cardiology fellow at UT. And I'm bringing some questions. Can you perform TAVR when there is no access? Or is this just a mission impossible? Let's see if uh, some innovation can help us. Okay, I have no disclosures. We have a 76-year-old male with multiple comorbids, as you can see, peripheral vascular disease, COPD, who had um, heart failure for a year in the setting of severe symptomatic uh, aortic stenosis. He was turned down for both TAVR and SEVR because of his high risk and lack of vascular access. Fast forward to a year. What happened? His EF declined, he has more symptoms, he's unable to tolerate medications, and he came to us, uh, and he came to us for a second opinion to see if there are any options. And as you can, as you can see in the next slide, his aortic valve is very calcified, valve area is less than 0.6, and uh, his EF is down. So this is classic low flow, low gradient. So what's the clinical challenge here? We basically have no access, and I can tell you why. So if you can see, um, distal abdominal aorta is heavily calcified, it's occluded, bilateral iliac has a significant disease, making transfemoral access very challenging. We also explored transcaval access, and if you can see, there is a significant disease of the descending aorta, and transcaval was not an option. Next slide, please. His bilateral common carotid arteries have significant atherosclerotic disease, putting him at a risk of uh, stroke, so that was not a feasible option. Next slide, please. He also has subclavian disease, putting him at a risk of having complications from the procedure, not to mention his radial arteries were also very calcified, and he was uh, having significant issues there. Next slide. Worst for the last. So he has porcelain aorta. So you can imagine a discussion with a surgeon seeing this and uh, asking them to take someone for surgery. So what did we do? We had a multidisciplinary, we had a multidisciplinary team meeting and we went over what our options are, our patient preferences, and we discussed that in order to uh, offer him something, we have to do an orthoiliac reconstruction and maybe we can try doing transfemoral um, tower. Next slide, please. Next slide. So we decided to proceed with aortic reconstruction. Here you can see uh, we obtained two bilateral femoral access uh, by using six French sheets. Uh, we tried to cross with a 018 wire but wasn't successful. 
We tried Asahi with the Trailblazer microcatheter, but you can see we are entering the subintimal space. So before proceeding further, we wanted to confirm, and uh, we obtained a third access. We, uh, we obtained a third access by uh, accessing the brachial artery, not to mention his radial were very small and calcified. Next slide. So here you can see the angiogram, and uh, you can see the distal abdominal aorta is occluded, and all our wires are in the subintimal space. Once we confirm that, we exchange, uh, we exchange our uh, microcatheter with a Pioneer Iowa's guided catheter. Most of you might know what that catheter is, but for fellows like me, it's the catheter we use in peripheral CTO intervention. Next slide, please. Uh, we put the aorta at the 12 o'clock position and fired the needle to uh, gain access to the true lumen. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here you can see, uh, once we were able to access the true lumen, uh, we had an integrated angiogram, and you can see, that we are in the true lumen and there is flow across the, uh, uh, across the aorta. Once we confirm that, next slide. So this is just a schematic diagram of how this catheter works. Next slide. We were able to deploy bilateral uh, kissing stents which were expanded with a nine millimeter balloon and if you can see the angiogram had excellent results, we were able to establish flow through the descending aorta going into uh, bilateral iliacs. Next slide. At the end of the procedure, we performed a bridging balloon valvuloplasty because we wanted to give some time for the stents to heal uh, and endothelize before we perform a tear. Next slide. In three months period, the patient underwent stage tavered procedure. Next slide. You can see the angiogram prior to the procedure. On the, uh, on the day of procedure, it looks great. The stents are well expanded, there is flow and we were able to advance our um, equipment by a standard transfemoral access through this site. Next slide. The patient underwent successful implantation of Sapien 3, 26 millimeter valve, as you can see a well-expanded valve here. Next slide. Uh, at the 30 day visit, the uh, uh, patient was doing great. He had his EF improved uh, and the gradient across the valve is uh, completely normal. Not to mention, he just had his one year follow up with Dr. Hamada, who is sitting here, was the first operator on the case, and patient is doing great. Um, next slide. So the take home points from my talk, aortic reconstruction and iliac extending are still viable options uh, if you are dealing with severe peripheral vascular disease, and we do take care of these patients who have significant disease to begin with. And learning these skills in collaboration with our surgeons is paramount for a successful TAVR program, especially in a tertiary care setting where you are seeing patients who are coming in, had exhausted multiple options, and are not, uh, now here for a second opinion. Thank you so much. Great case. Thank you for putting up with the technical challenges. No Hopefully we'll, we'll get them fixed for the next case. Um, the, it was a remarkable reconstruction. It had a beautiful result. Um, at the end of the case, was there any sort of injury? to the previously placed end grafts and everything came out okay? Yeah, everything was great. Uh, there was no like perforation, dissection, and the uh, patient did well. We didn't have any complications that we have to deal with. Good question. Did you end up doing a cut down when you did the TAVR or did you still do it percutaneous through the femoral access when you did the TAVR? We just uh, did the standard percutaneous transfemoral so, access. The only reason no why I ask is, is uh, your bailout, because you've had kissing stents in the aorta. Did you have any idea what would have happened if there was a groin complication? Because getting up and over with those two stents buried in the aorta would be quite difficult. Yes, so we had uh, vascular surgeons with us on the case, and we were prepared for that complications. And you can, uh, you know, like, you can have microperforations, dissection while you're going subintimal and crossing over, and you can have like a balloon tamponade at kissing stents, but yes, we had vascular surgery back up. I mean, if things go haywire, you have to have someone ready to jump in. Could you, you could still use the radial, right, as, as a backup? Yes. Uh, You'd have to, for, for salvage. definitely, but the problem is again, is you know, when you go radial, you'll have to have, unless it, your catheter length and balloon length, usually when I've bailed out myself, I've gone brachial just okay. to give myself the extra length, length yeah. to get down there to put a vibe on down or whatever you need to. Okay. Yeah, because they have the R2P systems now. Too. Yeah, and uh, the third access was actually obtained brachial because mm. the patient has significantly diseased radials bilaterally, very mm. small vessels, so uh, we had to go brachial on that. That's a good point. Yeah, that's an excellent case, excellent outcomes. Um, I think all TAVR operators have learned to, if they're not good peripheral interventionalists, to get to know a good peripheral mm -hmm. interventionalist because uh, this is often the case. Just a couple of things to point out. You guys did just a superb job. 
Um, fortunate that the occlusion was predominantly common iliac and your mm -hmm. externals and your common uh, femorals were adequate to allow you to get up through there. And then the other sort of word of warning for the audience in general is just because you can put a stent in somewhere doesn't mean that you'll be able to get by there. Uh, again, I, I suspect y'all used imaging, nine millimeters is a great size, you will be able to get through those, but uh, I've seen many times when people have put seven millimeter stents in, even eight millimeter stents, uh, but they're really not getting adequate luminal size and you still have trouble crossing uh, with the devices, so really great job. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for your time. So next up we have um, Dr. Rajiv Bhardwaj, uh, device closure of left coronary sinus to coronary sinus fistula. It's not coronary sinus, it is left circumflex artery. They have written wrong. Not okay. Are we, um, are the clicker's not going to work, are we just going to keep doing this manually, or? So just keep, do you want him to just keep saying next slide, or do you, are the clickers just, oh, there it is. Yeah. My case is eight years female. She, she presented with palpitation for, since childhood. She also had exertional chest pain for the last two years. XHS showed she did is, CT ratio of 55%, and ECG showed T, T inversion in lead V1 to V3. So when see, it was referred from outside with a suggestion of ASD, but when we saw the case, we found that coronary sinus was quite dilated, so that gave us some suspicion of the fistula. And there is right atrium and right ventricle enlargement is there, and there is Corny sinus, sinus is dilated. And on color, color Doppler, you can see there is increased color flow signals from the corny sinus. Then we took the patient for angiography, and we found that there is a large left main. Left anterior descending is very small. Left circumflex is hugely dilated, and there is large fistula connecting to the coronary sinus. So patient was taken off a device closure. There is obtuse angle of the circumflex, which gave us tough time. Initially, we took the O and 8 guide wire, but we could not negotiate any catheter over this wire. Then we took implantzer wire. We could not negotiate catheter over the implantzer wire. Then we keep, keep both 1-8 wire and implantzer wire, but still Castor could not be negotiated. So we thought what to do now. Then we took guide liner. We negotiated the guide liner through the left circumflex artery. And over this guide liner, we pushed our EL1 Castor. So our EL1 went in, inside the fistula. We had, on CT, we had assessed the size of the fistula. It was 5.3 mm. So we took 8 mm AVL, amplanzer vascular plug. And then this is the distal part which has been released, and we are checking whether it is in right place. So now, vascular plug is released, fistula is closed. Finally, good flow into the LED, fistula closed, circumflex artery, distal circumflex is normal. So in discussion point, prevalence of these fistulas is 0.002% of the general population. Most of the fistulas are asymptomatic and are accidentally detected. Large fistulas cause symptoms due to the volume overload, coronary steel, arrhythmias, and sometimes they can rupture also. Most of the fistulas arise from right coronary artery. Around one third arise from the LED. 
circumflex 5 to 15, 20 percent, and 5 percent of the fistula arise bilaterally from the left as well as the right coronary arteries. They drain in around 40 percent of the cases, they drain into the right ventricle, are in around 25 percent, 25 percent, and opening into the SVC is very rare. It's, uh, sorry, coronary sinus is very rare. So learning points, left coronary artery to left circumflex to coronary sinus fistula is a rare anomaly. Patients present with palpitation in angina if it is large. Left circumflex and left main are dilated with decreased flow to the LED. Device closure is challenging and may require mul multiple guiding testers, innovative ideas as in this case we use guideline guideliner to push our caster. Thank you. Great case, thank you for sharing. Uh, any comments from our panelists or anyone in the audience? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the only question I have was the, the concern about advancing um, 035 wires and then an AL, because you had an amplatzer wire at one point, yeah. right? That's a so the, pretty hefty wire the, down the, a corner. These fistulas tolerate wires because they are large fistulas. Larger, yeah. So mostly, it, because the left circumflex fistula is not very common. In LED, you can advance your guide, guideliner easily. But due to the obtuse angle, mm -hmm. we are not able to negotiate in this patient. Then we thought, had an idea, just coincidentally, we pushed, put the guideliner and yeah. we could negotiate it. And the guideliner went over a wire or just you went it without over, a wire? Over the wire. Over a wire, over yeah. The wire. And then over that, you advance an AL1 the, all the way yes, in. Yes, yes. Okay, that was impressive. And then the other question was about sizing, and I might, I might have missed this. Did you use a cardiac gated CT? We, to determine the yeah, size? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our size on CT was 5.3. Got it. So we oversized it by 20 to 30 percent. So we took 8 mm. For the 8 ABP2. Okay, fantastic. Just a random question, but do you, how do you anticoagulate this? Pardon? Do you anticoagulate? What did you choose to do for anticoagulation? Antiplatelets or aspirin? Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we used dual antiplatelet for one year. After that, single antiplatelet. I guess the, the proximal left main circ also looked very aneurysmal and, and yes. dilated. Yeah, th that bec because whenever there is a fistula, right. and the fistula is in the left circumflex, so low, sl uh, amount of the blood going into LED is very low. Right. Most of the blood is going to, so th that's a dilatation of it's the circumflex and uh, LED, uh, left main will occur. Correct. So I guess once, the question once is, once the is, yeah. fistula is closed, flow to the LED will increase and the LED will dilate. Got it. So that's the, the normal, the left main size and the circumflex, that in itself will not remodel. That won't get, but that'll stay that, that size for the rest of that, they, this they, child's they, life? They, they, they will regress with the thing. Okay, so there will be some remodeling. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Um, and if there's anybody in the audience that has any questions or comments, please um, um, step up as well. We'd love to learn from everybody here. Uh, so the next case uh, is being presented by Rajinder Shah, who's going to talk to us about incomplete expansion of a self-expanding tower, tower device leading to hemodynamic collapse. Hi, um, I'm Rajinder Shah. I'm one of the Cardiac Imaging Fellow at University of Florida. I'm here to present a challenging case, incomplete expansion of a self-expanding TAVR device leading to hemodynamic collapse. Dr. Narayan was the lead operator and I was part of the team as an internal medicine resident. Uh, I do not have any disclosure to reveal. So my patient, 78-year-old male um, with history of um, atrial fibrillation, severe tricuspid regurgitation, peripheral artery disease, presented with shortness of breath. Uh, after basic workup, we uh, did TTE and TEE um, that showed severe aortic stenosis with um, aortic valve mean gradient of 41.8, um, peak, aortic peak velocity of 4.1, and then aortic valve area calculated 0 .9, 0 0.59 centimeters square. So patient underwent right and left heart cath as a part of TAVR workup, which did not show any significant coronary artery disease. Um, then the diagnosis of uh, severe symptomatic aortic valve stenosis was made, and heart team discussion was held with the decision to transfemoral TAVR. So this clinical challenge starts here, uh, after the basic uh, pre-workup and everything, um, a 34 mm of Evolute Pro plus valve was advanced, 
via a femoral arterial approach. Uh, one thing unique in this case was there was a minimal infolding within the IFU range. It was visualized in the um, pre-evolved scene angiogram. So we called the vendor, but they said we can proceed with this case. So we uh, proceeded, and upon initiating the deployment, actually, asystole occurred. And uh, immediately, we decided to fully deploy the valve. ACLS was initiated, and uh, ECMO was started as well. So uh, we can see in the picture, uh, we had seen the infoldings uh, that was um, less than four nodes. Then um, in the angiogram and the TEE, it showed that the um, incomplete um, you know, expansion of the uh, valve and significant involved infolding, as seen in the picture, the uh, valve is not fully expanded. So immediately, um, we did the post dilation with the 26 millimeter and uh, 30 millimeter balloon that resulted in complete expansion of the TAVR valve, as shown in the video here. And um, the TEE also demonstrated well-functioning aortic valve. Um, after a hospital, um, hospital course, including winning of the um, ECMO and the supportive intensive care, the patient was eventually discharged to a rehab, and uh, post 30 day echo was done that showed uh, appropriate aortic valve function with a mean anti grade of 8 millimeter of mercury without any paravalvular uh, regurgitation and preserved left ventricular function. So, uh, just a question um, here is like, what is the significance, uh, what is the incidence of infolding of self expanding TAVR valve? Um, then I tried to find out this, then we, I don't have a clear answer, but one of the studies showed around 3.15% uh, of the uh, valves um, can have these infoldings. Uh, the most common infolded uh, valve size was 29 millimeter. The learning point for the team and the operator is evaluating the valve uh, in the uh, scene angiogram to see if there's any infolding and um, also if there is any incomplete expansion during the procedure, uh, the management will include the balloon expansion of the valve and supportive care, uh, including ECMO, um, that can be uh, beneficial for the patient and eventually will have a good result. Yeah, that is all, thank you. Yeah, that, that's pretty wild, uh, amazing case. I actually, I'm surprised that the percentage is even 3%. I mean, it. it should be hopefully a lot lower. Um, so is this something in the manufacturing of the, and I don't know the answer to this, is it the manufacturing of the valve or is it the, the prep that, that creates these? Do you know? Or does so, anybody know? Uh, so the, yeah, we, after we had this, we tried to find out uh, where it went wrong. But uh, actually we had nothing outside of the box until we got, uh, got the device. And then in the scene angiogram, we had noticed that uh, in folding. So we decided to hold for now and then call the vendor. But they said it, is, it can, uh, it don't have, you know, have any trouble, so we can proceed. That's how it went on. So, <laughs> so just two, um, uh, two questions for you, or maybe a question and a comment. Uh, my question is, w was the clinical field specialist from Medtronic present in the room during your procedure? No. Why is that? Uh, you did this in Florida, right? Sorry? This case was in Florida? No, 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 this is not in Florida. This was while I was in residency. Right now I'm doing uh, Oh, excuse me. Okay. That right. was in New York. You answered my question. Thank you. Um, my second uh, is a comment. Um, and I learned this lesson the hard way a few years ago. Um, it's still painful. Um, anytime you are implanting a self-expanding valve and you anticipate that you will have to post dilate it because of the anatomy, how calcified the valve is, or in a case where you see infolding and you decide to proceed, it's probably a good idea to implant the valve a little bit deeper than you ideally would because in almost every case of post dilatation of a self-expanding valve, the valve always moves more aortic. So those of you who are fellows in structural training or who are gonna be attending structuralists, Self-expanding valve, maybe half a node, a little bit deeper, because when you post-dilate, it will come up. It's hard to anticipate that, but in the infolding scenarios, which are very rare, I'm surprised that, uh, also surprised it's 3%, I would think it'd be less than 1%, but in infolding scenarios, when you post-dilate, it really springs. So you may even want to be slightly deeper 
in those cases. Obviously, it's a bit of a cheek puckering moment, but thank you. Great case. Sorry, Tim, you had a question? Or yeah, Lucy? I was just going to, it's not a question, but I was just going to piggyback on that. It's literally, uh, basically, if you're going to use a self explaining platform, I would almost even argue, too, we are very big on pre dilatation. A lot of people don't seem to be very aggressive pre dilatation for a number of reasons, but I would tell you in this situation where, forget the infolding issue, but if you have a heavily calcified valve and you are going to utilize a self expanding platform, we tend to be quite aggressive with our pre dilatation for that reason that what Rahul just mentioned is, is that if you do deploy high, say zero, one, or two around that level, post dilating that valve, there is always a risk of pop out. So going aggressive with the pre-dilatation, so hopefully you don't have to post-dilate, would be where I would lean towards doing. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Excellent point. All right, uh, Dr. Ali Al Saad will be talking with us about multi-view coronary angiography to determine coronary protection during valve valve tap. All right, thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I have no disclosures to make here. Uh, let's do our case here. So we have a 76-year-old male with a history of severe AS due to bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, he had a bioprosthetic aortic valve implantation surgical uh, back in 2012 with our favorite valve, Trifecta 23. Uh, he developed, unfortunately, an infective endocarditis episode back in 2021 after dental procedure, despite antibiotics. And he developed, actually, moderate to severe AI then with mild stenosis or degenerated valve that was somehow managed medically. And the team decided that it's fine. His EF is 45, he recovered, that mass that was there kind of cleared up, let's leave it alone. And I think this is a really nice point to illustrate. We're so emotionally attached to AS, but not to AI. We tend to ignore AI more than we think. And th I think that came up uh, this morning when we were discussing AI and, and Tavern AI, and anecdotally, uh, in my last year of practice, I've noticed that this is very true. So when I uh, uh, got to learn about the patient and knew him, he was referred to me in uh, uh, February 2023, and his EF was 25%, unfortunately. So this is his echo, and kind of classic dilated LV, AI picture, uh, significant AI on his TEE, Leaflets were not co-opting wells, uh, well, and there's this uh, uh, eccentric jet that probably is the culprit for all of his uh, issues. He was not doing very well. He was functional class two, three. He's a very active guy, and then slowly, slowly, and progressively uh, getting worse. Uh, this is his uh, coronary angiogram, and here we can see his left system, and in this view, we can see that maybe the left main is close to the uh, uh, struts of the bioprosthetic valve. Here, maybe we see it, it's a little bit off on this uh, LAO crany view, but interestingly, his RCA, you can see it's above the uh, uh, stent of the valve as well, and, and inadvertently, the catheter, the JR, came out a little bit, showing us that uh, how the valve is not in a direct interaction with the coronary. So once I saw this angiogram, which was part of my review of the case before I talked to him, uh, I, I felt reassured that I think we're okay. I think we're okay. Now we do the CT scan after we talked to him about Tavern, and obviously he, he was discussed in the heart uh, team. He was deemed not to be a good candidate for uh, another sternotomy. So we got to the CT Taver, and the CT Taver showed uh, okay sinuses, kind of on the, on the okay side, it's about 20, uh, uh, 30, 31. Uh, his aorta is a little dilated, but not prohibitive. And again, he's 23 trifecta, which qualifies him for a 26 uh, uh, self-expanding uh, valve which was the plan to place. Now, his coronary heights were 10 on the left side and about 14 on the right. However, doing a little bit of a closer look, his VTC was not very appealing on the right. On the left, it was good. But on the right, it was 2.4, less than four millimeters, which is the level that we get concerned about. So the, this is, again, what we talked about. He qualifies for a 26 sapient because of the true ID is 21. So uh, uh, the question that came up here, what should we do? Is it uh, a case that I should be concerned? I was trained in a, uh, in a center that, although we loved Basilica, we didn't do it much. We thought it's too extensive, it's labor intense, success is not perfect, it's an area of unmet need, we need better tools to cut those leaflets. So should we just put a guide, protect, should we just feel okay and say that the height on the angiogram was okay? 
So all of those kind of uh, things kind of came in, in mind. Uh, just wanted to kind of mention that coronary obstruction is a real risk in valve and valve. More than six times increase when you compare it to the native uh, uh, valve. And about a third of those cases can have delayed presentation, which is even worse. And if they happen, they are catastrophic presentations usually. So it's not something to overlook at all, especially in my first year of practice. So uh, 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 things that you look at for high risk uh, features, including coronary heights less than 12, shallow sinuses less than 30, and also a VTC less than four as we showed. And uh, as we see here in this nice kind of illustration, is that the coronary obstruction has gone down significantly in the recent years as the operator experience improved. And as we got better in what we do and, and kind of consider it as a more serious risk. And I hope this uh, yellow box will get even smaller as we develop more tools to debulk the, the leaflets. Now, uh, we also know that stented externally mounted leaflets like the trifecta valve has a little bit of a higher risk just because of the way the leaflets can sequester this highness. This kind of like illustration of the types of valves and the, you can see the trifecta is up there. We talked about this. So these are the two options that I personally had in mind. I was like, I can't just sit on this and, and do nothing. Let me try to do something minimal at least. So uh, on the uh, left side, you can see that the coronary protection with a guide, you can put a wire down the coronary. That's before you deploy the valve, obviously. And you have two options. Either you put a, a guide extension extending into the coronary with or without a stent that you can snorkel and pull back and create kind of a channel for the blood flow if obstruction to happen. Uh, uh, I elected not to put a stent in this pr particular case. I just put a guide. Uh, we put a wire down the right coronary artery, and then we took shots as we were, as we were going through the process. And here you can see that the uh, JR guide is engaged into the RCA, uh, a wire, a run-through wire down, and a guide liner kind of came in after that too. You can see it in this image. Uh, we deployed the valve at 80% and we took a pigtail shot that showed that the, uh, there was some flow in the vessel. And also here, there was a nice point that I kind of learned specifically from this case. If you have the guideliner in and you inject, I don't think this can give you a realistic kind of point or of where, uh, uh, whether you obstructed the coronary or not. So I kind of looked into two things. First, I, I kind of uh, took a, uh, a quick look at the pressures and so if the, if the pressure within the coronary is, is normal, kind of conducting normally, that's one of the points. And two, uh, at some point you got to pull the guide liner back a little bit, keeping the wire in, and take a guide shot and make sure that you have still flow within the coronary. So I was a little bit extra careful in this case, kind of like took all kind of shots that we thought, we changed the angles a little bit and then we deployed the valve which looked nice and sitting well. Uh, no coronary obstruction obviously happened or anything like that. Uh, so uh, we wanted to kind of share those kind of key uh, learning points is high risk features for coronary obstruction uh, and valve and valve should be meticulously examined uh, prior to the procedure. And coronary and geography, perhaps multiple views can help to determine where, which way you should go and always hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Thank you very much. I'm curious, what would you guys have done in a similar case? Uh, this was like one of my early cases, obviously. At so th this is a great case, and there are so many learning points about this case that uh, obviously we don't have time to get into everything uh, related to that. But um, I've had two cases, uh, both of which I had regret. In one case, I protected the coronary without a guideliner. A wire was down the vessel. Um, and I had a stent in the guide, but not, uh, and, this, and the stent was down the coronary, but there was no guide liner, just a wire and a stent. I deployed, it was a balloon expandable valve, I deployed the valve, coronary was open, so I didn't need to stent it. Upon pulling the stent back, the stent stripped on the valve, and ended up having to stent the osteal right and crush that stent up against the vessel wall. So everything went okay, but it was a regretful scenario. After that case, I moved to a protocol that if I ever do this, I always put a guide liner down, and I don't necessarily have a stent there, and if I do, I never let it leave the guide liner. 
The second regret I had was I had a case where I did exactly what you did. I pulled the guide and the guide liner back because I was concerned that I wasn't able to appreciate whether or not it was occluded. The vessel was occluded, and, and by pulling everything back, I was never able to get anything back down the vessel. Luckily, somehow, I don't know how, but with the help of a balloon tracking, I basically did balloon assisted tracking of the guide liner and the, and the guide back towards the ostium tool to rescue the vessel, and the patient also did okay. So two things I learned from these two cases. Number one, when I have equipment down a coronary, like a guide liner or a guide, I never surrender it. I never pull it back because I'm concerned I may not be able to get back in, depending on how big my sinuses are. And number two, I always use a guide liner when I protect a vessel, and I use some other means to assess if my coronary is still paid rather than surrendering the equipment or pulling things back. But uh, I agree with um, proprietary devices for leaflet modification, um, some of which are, I hear, very easy to use. I have no personal experience with them, like Shortcut and Telltale. Um, this is going to rapidly change our world. But coronary protection has certain do's and don'ts. And uh, you know, when you miss it and you get a case uh, that doesn't go so well, it's burned in your mind forever. In your second case, you you just you said you pulled everything back, but you left the wire down. Okay. Um, the the other idea would be to do a balloon valvular plasty in the beginning and see what that does to the leaflets. You can do angiography, root angiography with the balloon inflation, and you can kind of see if those leaflets are going to be thrown over in front of the coronaries. Great, great. That's a great thought, Tim, for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And one thing I have to say though is because uh, my concern with self-expanding and coronary snorkeling techniques is how are you going to get back in? Because again, you know, we've all been there where something traumatic has happened and you have to rescue it on the table. But if you have an elective situation, which you did, because my concern is when you, if you had to snorkel that at right coronary, how far back would that stent reach? Because you have, you know, frame bending the coronary stent. So that stent has to either snorkel all the way up above and re-entering that coronary. Uh, what was your plan? Were you going to just put a long 30-something odd length stent from the coronary osseo up above? Exactly. That was my thought when I was planning to put the stent. Uh, uh, my thought was maybe 3-5 uh, by 20-something 20, 20 stent, try to snorkel it from the osseum out, which I have done a couple in, during my training, and they all worked fine. Granted, I've never seen them after that. I don't know what's going to happen. If they're going to go somewhere and have a STEMI, who's going to be the one dealing with that fun? That's always something that concerns me, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think just a couple of updates on shortcut is, is, is since Rahul mentioned it, it's a, a dedicated system to go in and kind of grab on each of the, the cusp leaflets individually. And then, and then the way the current mechanism works is you actually create the initial bite at the root of the, the sinus and then you pull up. And it's actually not a clean cut, it actually evulses the, the tissue. And so there are some concerns about that. Um, so Telltale is basically you know, where all the systems you need to create um, a rail and to ultimately to cauterize, it's all like, you know, instead of taking 20 minutes on the back table to get everything ready, everything's ready to go and within five minutes. But it's still very technically super demanding. So it will still continue. These patients will still continue to be a challenge. These dedicated systems are probably going to start coming, getting, getting commercialized in the next five years or so. Telltale is a little bit closer. Their pivotal trial is completed. But uh, it's still going to be a challenge quite a bit. So. And I think that with uh, patients, when we talk about low-risk TAVR, I mean, we have extensive CT planning in, before every TAVR case. All of us do. So if you have low-risk patients where you have a concern for cornea obstruction, I mean, that's a surgical case. You're not going to snorkel stent someone who's got an STS score of 0.5%. I mean, that's, that's crazy. We don't have any durable data on that, but yeah. There's actually a, another company that's developing um, a system to basically go in and score the aortic valve leaflets. So if you score the aortic valve leaflets, you increase the mobility. You're not just doing a, uh, just a plain valvuloplasty. You're actually scoring it. You grab onto the leaflets, you score it, so that way it increases the mobility, reduces the gradients and you're potentially delaying the need for an implant. Uh, and so the thought is, is that, that when you start getting these low risk patients, rather than saying, okay, here's your index procedure, but then you might need two more procedures down the line, you could potentially delay the need for the first implant by another 10 to 20 years. So there's some interesting work being done. Yeah. Um, so all right, so we'll move on. Uh, we've got a little bit of time since we had, had uh, one of our speakers uh, who wasn't here. So the next presentation is by uh, Dr. Nair Lugo-Fagundo. 
who is, uh, yep, that's her. Uh, she's going to be talking to us about leading the way. She wins the award for the shortest title. So the leads are in the way, so trying to make something. <laughs> yes. So, um, so yeah, um, I'm Nair Lugo Fagundo. So I'm a general first year cardiology fellow at Mayo Clinic Florida, and I would like to thank Dr. Elsaba, who has been my mentor, and I'm talking behalf of him for this case. So I have no disclosures. So this is an 83-year-old female. Um, she presented with shortness of breath. She had a past medical history of rheumatic heart disease, um, where she had a mitral valve replacement with a bioprosthetic valve, and she also had a tricuspid valve repair. And then she also had a left atrial appendage ligation with a post-operative pacemaker. Um, and this was 16 years prior to this presentation. So she had, um, because of her shortness of breath, it's most likely in the setting of her severe mitral valve bioprosthetic regurgitation and acute on chronic um, congestive heart failure. So the plan was to do a trans transcatheter valve and val like valve replacement um, with a 29 plus two millimeter sapien valve. Um, and so that was the plan. So imagings were done prior to the procedure. So she had an echocardiogram which showed the mitral valve um, bioprosthetic degeneration. And then she also had the CT scan, which shows here the pacemaker leads um, that were um, the, you know, this going down to the IVC as you can see here. So the clinical challenge was that when they deployed the 12 um, millimeter times 40 of the Evercross balloon to do the atrial, um, the balloon septostomy. Um, they noticed that there was some resistance during the balloon flossing at the IVC and device like lead junction due to the interaction with the leads. So the unfortunate, you know, the question was in this moment in time is like what to do in this scenario if we're having some resistance when we, they were trying to deploy the valve. Um, and so one of the things that they did was at first, um, they crossed a second wire um, in which that was parallel to the safari wire, and then they introduced the Evercross balloon as a buddy wire with the buddy balloon to displace the lead. But unfortunately, that didn't help, and that continued to cause some resistance. Another thing that also occurred is that they tried to increase the balloon as well from 12 millimeters to 16 millimeters, but unfortunately, that also continued to cause some resistance. So the question is like, what do we do next in this clinical challenge? So what they did decided to do was to use a steerable sheath to deflect the leads, and that actually helped with, in order to deploy the valve. Um, so basically, when I show this slide, yes, it shows the resolution. So as you see here in the video, they were able to deflect the leads and then able to deploy the valve. Um, successfully. Prior to the um, procedure, she did have some perivabular um, um, leakage, um, which still was seen after the procedure as well, but there was like no um, LVOT obstruction, um, and they considered this as a successful um, case. So one of the key learning opportunities, um, not for the operator and the team, is that pacemaker leads can interfere when you're doing a transcatheter hard valve delivery at the IVC junction. And in order to do, or to at least know what's gonna happen, it's predicted by a CT scan with an echocardiogram. And the other thing also with the flossing as presented during this presentation. Um, and so one of the things that we can promote or learn about this is using steerable sheets that can help deflate pacemaker leads um, in order to in order to deploy the valve. Thank you very much. Uh, was a cool case. Um, so question I have is, was the patient pacemaker dependent? And did yes. you have a backup plan? God forbid you kind of dislodged uh, one or both of those RV leads. It looked like there was at least two RV leads yeah. on there. So they did have a backup plan during the procedure. So um, I talked with the interventionalist, Dr. Elsa Bond. Yes, they did have a backup plan in case. So I guess my question was, maybe we couldn't see it on the fluoros, mm -hmm. but as you were bringing the valve up, you, it was catching the lead and you could just see it 
pulling on the lead? And how, how hard did you push before you decided that was too So they too tried much? multiple attempts. So like the first time that they did it with the 12 times 40 um, with the Evercross balloon, um, they first um, created the deployment of the valve at the IBC. And when they were going to, going to the interatrial septum, that's when they started noticing some resistance. So they just tried multiple attempts. Um, it looks like approximately, they did it by different mechanisms, like I had mentioned with like the buddy balloon, um, as well as inflating the balloon to 16 millimeters. So they did, it, they did it approximately like four to five times until they decided to do the steerable sheet. So great case. I had a similar experience where I was doing an off-label tricuspid clip and I used an agilis to move the lead to be able to clip in the anteroseptal commissure. So this technique works very well. Um, the, cha the technical difficulty is to get the hook of the agilis or nagari over the lead, which on flora always looks easy in these cases that you see people presenting, but it's like, it's, it's actually very difficult, especially if it's hugging the, the fossa. And then the other thing was, uh, I was just thinking it while you were presenting your case, that this actually is a nice example of the use of the opsins, uh, and I have no financial disclosures, by the way, um, the use of the opsins uh, medical savvy wire, because in a case like this, if you were manipulating the lead and you were to dislodge it, you would have pacing capability through the LV savvy wire. Uh, in my case, I always put a TVP anyway, so, but. Uh, it's always good to have a backup option and have some other alternate pacing uh, methodology. Yeah. Great case. Thank you. Okay, we have um, Dr. Luis Augusto Palma Dalin, uh, who will be talking with us about when less is more annual rupture during transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. For, the, for CVI for inviting me for, to be here today. And on behalf of my team from uh, University Hospitals, the Stroke Heart Team, and Dr. Chizan and Dr. Philby, the directors, I'd like to present this case, a uh, very unique case. I don't have any disclosure, disclosures for this presentation. It was a 76-year-old a male who was uh, referred from an outside institution for us due to severe aortic stenosis and multivessel coronary artery disease. And on top of that, he had pulmonary disease, very significant pulmonary disease, and he was homo 2 dependent, and eject low ejection fraction of 35%, and hyperlipidemia and other comorbidities. And he was transferred because he was on decompensated heart failure and have uh, acute, uh, acute, what's going on? Okay. You might have to, if you want to read off the back. Okay, that's okay. So the TTE was showing an ejection fraction of 35% and a mean gradient of 48. So it was uh, definitely a severe aortic stenosis. His left heart, heart catheterization was showing multivessel coronary disease. And the CT reading was showing a very calcified aorta with a, a porcelain aorta with a perimeter of 84 and area of 552. That was uh, a good choice for either a sapin 20, 26 or an evolute 34 valve. So because of the heavy calcification, the person aorta to avoid any kind of stroke while introducing the device, we opted for the sapin device for this case. Here's the echo showing very heavily calcified aortic valve. And here are the, our CT measurements showing a very calcified uh, ascending aorta with an um, area of 550, good for, an, as I said, a sapient 26. So we proceeded as we do all the time with a, a transfemoral approach. And we implanted the sapient 326 plus two CCs, and it was a su successful deployment. But when we did the angiogram after the deployment, we could see a rupture, an annular rupture of the valve, right? and immediately the patient started to crash and had a pericardial effusion and a cardiac tamponade. So this is the deployment of the valve, nothing major, it was pretty straightforward uh, deployment to the left and to the right. You can see that our angiogram afterwards showing uh, the perforation of the, the rupture of the valve. So you can see 
the right up is the left corner, and just below the valve, you can see like a big perforation, a rupture of the nerves. So at this point, the patient started to crash, so we activated the OR so that they could be ready in case we should move the patient to the OR, right? So the first thing to do is to think of the worst case scenario. So the OR was, was prepared for us, and then we performed a pericardial synthesis uh, with 1.5 cc uh, liters removal of blood. Some of that was re reinfused in the patient. We gave protamine to revert the anticoagulation. The patient was intubated, sedated, uh, under mechanical ventilation. And we were able to, at that point, uh, control the bleeding. So we repeated the echo afterwards. There was no more effusion left. And we have a very unique setup in our cat lab. So we have the cat lab together with the CT, together with the MRI. So we just crossed the door, and we took the patient from the cat lab to the CT. And we performed a CT that showed that there was no more um, pericardial effusion and no more signs of active bleeding through the valve. So we were comfortable with that, and we just sent the patient to the ICU at, this, at that point. So this is the echo showing a big major pericardial effusion that was, was tap, right? And this, uh, for, we double checked if there was no coronary obstruction, and indeed there was no coronary obstruction at that point. So we were kind of comfortable with that. This is the echo post in, in the ICU, showing there are no more signs of pericardial effusion. So despite success, of course, the, the tavern has been associated with uh, life-threatening situations such as that one that we showed. Uh, advanced in pre-procedural screening are, are of utmost importance for us to predict what can happen and to be prepared if that uh, catastrophic events eventually happen. So usually we can have like a rupture in the annulus, supranular or, or submanular. In our case, it was submanular rupture. And the first day, the patient was extubated. And the second day, we removed the, the drain successfully. The third day, the patient was weaned off uh, vasopressors and was sent to the, to the floor. And on the fifth day, the patient went home uneventfully. So the key learn parts for this is that um, we always must be prepared for the worst, right? And in this case, the first thing that we did was to activate the OR. Usually in this case, we have to take the patient and do like an emergency surgery, but we hope we, we could manage it clinically successfully based on the echo, based on the CT uh, results, and based on our preventive experience. So, and last but not least, it's of utmost importance for us to check what's going on with the valve, which, what, which device should be, should be chosen, and what to do in case of these devastating events. Thank you very much. Sure, Nuas, would you like to make a comment? I was just gonna say that's uh, freaking amazing, I guess, you know, the best way to put it. I mean, honestly, it's, the question is, what's the mechanism, you know, it, this to me in 99.9% .9 of the cases is open on the table. I mean, there's no time to go to CT and bring them back and you know, you tap, but you open. I mean, that's pretty much the standard of therapy for these type of patients. I mean, death is pretty imminent otherwise. Is the mechanisms, and I know, did it, Guillermo said, did he think it was from a closure from the seal of the valve? Like, well, how did the annular rupture contain, because obviously you tapped the conclusion of the rupture, but not the start. How did, what did he, what was his opinion or your opinion yeah. of how to close? That's a great question. As I said, I can give my opinion. We, ha we can not be sure what happened, right? We think it was a sub uh, rupture because of the spike of calcium. And when we reverted the anticoagulation, that clot, whatever was there, just closed the, the small hole. So we were lucky in this case to have this. But as you said, most of those cases must go to the OR. Or as you said, they don't have time to go there. So we have to do an emergency cut down in the cat lab. So. We have actually had a case similar to that many years ago where we had an annular rupture and the surgeons would not operate. They were deemed inoperable, which I'm sort of surprised your surgeons were considering operating on this patient. I would have assumed they would have deemed him inoperable with pulmonary fibrosis and four liters of oxygen. Yeah, it was contraindicated. Contraindicated. Right. So, so we have seen that once before too. So I don't know the mechanism. Uh, I kind of liken it to uh, if you've ever seen a coronary 
uh, perforation. Uh, sometimes you can put a regular stent in there and it will, it, you know, it'll close it up, probably because it's just shoving tissue over uh, it enough to uh, push it over the hole. Um, I had another point. Oh, my, my other point was that um, I would be suspicious that this was possibly related to chronic steroid use. Was he had probably been on steroids for a while or at some point given his advanced pulmonary disease, mm -hmm. and that is thought to be a, uh, a risk for uh, annular rupture. Maybe uh, we don't have kind of no. Most probably yes, right? But we don't know. Yeah, th this this is a just like a absolutely amazing case. Uh, this patient would have died in uh, uh, 9.9 out of 10 circumstances. Um, and as much as we talk about urgent sternotomy, and yes, that is the general approach in these scenarios in many instances, those patients usually don't do well even if they survive and make it out of the room. Um, two quick comments. One is um, uh, I had a patient with chronic steroid use in whom I had an LAA perforation and I injected flow seal in the pericardium, patient could, did great, sealed, uh, and did not require any surgery. So that could have been a potential use here. Tom Wagner from Tucson, um, and acknowledgement to him for teaching me the steps on how to do that that night at 11 o'clock when I had to do that. Uh, but Tom Wagner has a case in which he had an annular rupture just like yours, and he um, has, has published that. It's, it's public knowledge, and he had injected flow seal, and his patient did very well. Um, so there are transcatheter techniques that several amazing operators have taught us that can be used um, to maybe salvage some of these situations. But the fact that your patient was survived and did well without the use of any of those techniques other than protamine and autotransfusion is just incredible. Um, so it's just a fantastic case. And, uh, really interesting you, that, you know, with protamine, it was stable. You had time to intubate and to do the pericardial synthesis, but you know, as an imager here, um, you know, we kind of forget that there's also TE available. So, you know, when that's going on, TE can be helpful to figure it out. I've been unfortunate to fortunate enough to be in a case like this before. And, you know, I immediately dropped the TE probe and we found exactly where the rupture was. Um, in our case, they did go to surgery, but at least they knew where to look. Um, that's a great point for throughout our, our procedures. We have a, a stenographer inside the room so that at any point we can request the imaging and check what's going on. So sometimes we do it multiple times to be on the safer side. Actually, Dr. Mauricio Cohen showed a case at a conference a couple months ago in which he uh, coiled one of these annular ruptures. And I, thought that, I thought that was incredible, too. So there are so many amazing things that people are doing uh, to manage this, but th this is incredible. Yeah. One final comment. Uh, Sorry, comment. Of course, you're probably thinking, in retrospect, I wish we hadn't oversized the valve. And I think that's a really important learning point, too, that, you yeah. know, the previous session was on lifetime management. That is not an issue in this guy, right? I mean, you're hoping to get one, two, three years out of him. And so being overly aggressive, uh, we've all fallen into that trap, but I think you need to resist that. You can always post-dilate if there's a big leak, but if you put it in too big, you know, this can happen. Someone in the audience. We're, we're trying to, go, to be on the safer side because of the calcification. Usually in our service, we usually go to the Evolute, to the self-expanding. But at that time, it was an Evolute Pro, not Evolute Flex. So we could not be able to flex the tip. So we were concerned of scratching the aorta and embolizing and get a stroke. So that's why we chose the, the Sapien with a much more flexible tip. Yeah, my mind always jumps towards um, innovative strategies to prevent things like this. And so, you know, would, and I know there are several people working on, like it's similar to how we now uh, modify the calcium burden inside coronaries. I mean, is there a way to modify annular calcium so that rather than nuggets of calcium just getting pushed out, they're fractured, so they just kind of disperse uh, with, that, uh, with that amount of force uh, from, the, from the valves going up? Um, there, there were a few presentations of people using peripheral shockwave balloons kind of going in and delivering uh, lithotripsy to the annulus to prevent somebody with very eccentric chunks of calcium uh, to, to kind of break up that calcium. And then there are several manufacturers now working on dedicated balloons uh, for the aortic valve and the mitral valve uh, for patients with bad mitral annular calcification uh, to see if you can just disrupt the calcium without the architecture and still maintain the integrity. Uh, so hopefully at some point this will not be an issue. All right, cool. Thank, thank you so much.
All right, so uh, the person with the award for the longest title is uh, Dr. Mohamed Sali, who's going to come up and talk to us about, take a breath here, a challenging case of transcath aortic valve and valve and freestyle aortic valve as a bridge to a redo surgical aortic valve replacement. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Saleh. I'm one of uh, the general fellow, hopefully going, uh, staying in the heart hospital for IC and hopefully structural afterward. Um, it's kind of a long case, but interesting. It's about the whole idea about the, of this case is about the management strategy and the multidisciplinary team. Uh, I have no disclosure, looking for one, hopefully soon. <laughs> Um, this is the case of presentation. Uh, we have a 47 years old female, uh, history of bicuspid aortic valve that were, and aortopathy that uh, was operated on in 2005 with a 23 millimeter freestyle valve and aortic replacement, uh, root replacement in uh, 2005. This was degenerated around like uh, 13 le uh, years later that required a core valve implantation with a 26 millimeter valve. Uh, she presented with acute onset, shortness of breath, orthopnea, and peripheral edema. She had a pa uh, her past medical history is hair by caspid valve, aortopathy, and asthma. She had the history of uh, aortic valve replacement surgery and uh, knee surgery. She doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, no illustrate use, married, and has normal life. Um, no family history of aortopathy or bicuspid disease. Her medication were, cardiac medication were only uh, aspirin and uh, losartan. Um, so uh, echo uh, was done as part of the screening uh, uh, and investigation to identify what is the underlying cause. And it looks like uh, the patient uh, had severe uh, aortic regurgitation. Her LVF was found to be at 20 to 25 percent. And uh, so we, just from the imaging, we know that the patient is, uh, and like has um, severe AI. So um, now at this point, the patient will need a new valve. Uh, everybody was agreed on. So we did uh, part of the pre-procedural planning and 4D CT of the heart was done. Um, we identified the prior valves. There, the mechanism of the valve failure was determined to be the degeneration of the valve. And all the measurements were reported. Um, coronary CTA was included in the pre-procedural planning and there was none, no evidence of obstructive coronary uh, disease. And overall, the, like, the height of the coronary arteries were, uh, were uh, acceptable, like more than the limit. So, and also part of the planning, we did a CT for her lung, and we can tell that there is significant issue in her lung going on. Like she has severe like parenchymal lung disease and interstitial edema. So um, at this point, like the team stopped and kind of uh, consulted between the surgical team, the structural team, and the imaging team, and giving her underlying uh, uh, condition, the patient, we know that she will need a valve replacement. Ideally, given her age, she will need a surgical valve. But given her uh, lung issue, uh, it was felt that she will end up with uh, uh, ECMO support because of significant lung issue. She was like uh, kind of a prohibitive risk at that point of time. So we, uh, after discussion, the team uh, given her young age, the likelihood of recovery, the team felt like, let's give her a third valve with a uh, Sabian valve and give her a chance of recovery and then bridge her as uh, for stage surgical valve implantation. So, um, uh, trans, uh, like non-invasive procedure, many invasive procedure was planned and uh, temporary pacemaker wire was inserted through right IJ, radial access was obtained with a slender 60 French sheet, um, right femoral artery was accessed under uh, ultrasound guidance, and then uh, AMBLAPS extra strip wire uh, up uh, across the aortic valve with a big tail, and then uh, the delivery sheet was inserted. And uh, this is just, the crossing was not hard at all. There was no, almost no valve leaflet. And uh, um, so after that, the, the valve was deployed and we, like the operator elected to kind of 
put the valve a little bit down in the L, like toward the LVOT and um, uh, implanted well. There was no issue immediate. Uh, we did uh, angiogram and we, saw, uh, we see like the coronaries are fine and patent. Uh, the groin was uh, checked afterward and was closed with two uh, periclosed devices. Um, we, the same as uh, the previous uh, speakers talked, we have the echocardiographer like technician in the room and we do scan immediately afterward. The LBF still down, the valve uh, VMAX and the mean gradient were uh, fine. We know that the patient will have some evidence or uh, of patient processes mismatch given the like uh, prior uh, interventions. So um, patient was started on aliquis. We have valve and valve and prior valve. Uh, guideline directed medical therapy. She was doing well, uh, discharge home on diuretics and antibiotic course and was scheduled for follow-up clinic. Luckily, I just logged into her chart uh, today and added the follow-up imaging. Uh, on follow-up, we can see that um, the LBEF has improved to the normal. I have the four chamber and two chamber in the next slide. And the valve was uh, functioning well. There was no evidence of paravalvular leak or uh, significant regurgitation. Um, the LBEF is back to normal. Patient feeling great. And she, uh, like at this point, um, I feel like the, the team is discussing, should we give her a little bit more time? She's ready to be intervened on, but you know, who knows when it's gonna degenerate as long as we're having like more valve and valve. The risk of degeneration will be more and faster, probably. So uh, the kind of learning point, a lot of people do valve and valve, and um, it's many invasive procedure, and uh, but valve and valve and valve is kind of, uh, sometimes we have to do a multidisciplinary discussion regarding that uh, option, especially in young patients, when we know uh, that like, a surgical mechanical valve will give her uh, a long uh, term outcome. Uh, this, our patient was more challenging given the prior two valves, and I think the most important point is multidisciplinary discussion regarding decision making and planning. Thank you. A quick question on what, maybe I just misread it. What was the, the valve that you put in? It said something about an Aspen. 20. A 20 millimeter uh, Sapien 3 Ultra. Oh, okay. I think I, yeah. maybe I'm dyslexic. I, I read Aspen, so it's probably Sapien. Yeah. Okay. All right. That makes a lot more sense. Um, the final comment is about kicking the can down the road is, is often you do these bridging procedures and, uh, and, and then you call your surgeon buddy and say, hey, I just did this bridging procedure. Patient's ready for surgery. Oh, let's... Let's just wait another month. We'll see how the patient does. And then, the, yeah, it's a bridge to nowhere. Uh, and so then what happens is the next time they come in, again, they're an extremist. Oh, they're too sick for surgery. And so it's a vicious trap uh, that uh, all of us are very familiar with. So that's the only thing I would say to be mindful of. So any other questions or comments? Or? No, I, well, in disclosure, that's a sister or, uh, organization of mine, so I know this, the surgical team and the interventional team, and I know they have an excellent uh, surgical team and an excellent working relationship, so um, I, I think it was a great approach knowing that the surgeons would go in there. They're very comfortable doing aortic surgery as well as AVR, and I know they'll do a good job, uh, and that's tremendous that you took her from, you know, a higher risk patient with LV dysfunction to someone who had normalized her LV. I think, I think that will be helpful. Um, I, I don't, I'd be interested in what y'all think. I, I thought that um, the valve almost looked too low, that there might be leaflet overhang there. What, what do y'all think about concerns there? Yeah, I mean, uh, it'd be great to see a CT uh, uh, on the patient um, or, or even a transesophageal echo. Uh, uh, in follow-up, but... Um, For the next valve and valve and valve. Right. And valve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the title will be even longer. Yeah, um, yeah no, definitely overhang uh, it was a concern. It looked it looked deep to me. Uh, and the patient's going to need something to be done surgically. Actually, as of now, she has a planned, like, mechanical valve implantation scheduled for August 15. Okay. So. Yeah. yeah. Just Fingers curious crossed. what the surgeon said of cutting out three valves now. You know, so now there's not just two layers, but three layers of dent valve. Talk about a pinwheel. Yeah. 
think the initial issue too is why did she even get the core valve? You know, if you look at just being Monday morning quarterback, obviously at her age, I mean, after the first valve went down, why not get a mechanical? She already had kids, just be done with, you know. You know, it's one of those where, again, though, I hate being that person, always bringing it up because, you know, it is something that, you know, we present these cases and we're like, whoa, look how cool these percutaneous devices are. And then the argument, of course, goes back to, well, could they have just been a surgical person to begin with? So, again, I don't know the background of why she got that. Maybe she was an extremist the first time she came in with failure when her bioprosthetic surgical valve went down. I'm not sure, but it always argues, you know, where TAVR is kind of the runaway train a little bit. Patients want it, but it doesn't mean they should get it, you know, so. Yeah, because she was still only, what, 40 years old at the time. So, yeah. Comment from the audience. Oh, and that lying pacemaker, no. So is, I guess, does the risk of having uh, big health loss go up with the health valve? Or is like, you know, <laughs> not much, not much. Valve, yeah. So. Gen generally speaking, I mean, uh, if you were to take like all comer valve and valves where there's a surgical prosthesis and you're putting a transcatheter inside the surgical prosthesis, usually the pacemaker rates are low if they don't, because you're constrained by this um, uh, stent struts of the surgical valve. Now, of course, a lot of that goes out the window if you have a low, uh, deep implant, uh, which may have been in this case, uh, or if you're doing BVF after you've deployed, right? So there are all these other nuances. But if you're just doing a straightforward valve and valve tavern inside of a medium to large label size surgical valve, uh, pacemaker rates are usually pretty low. I don't know if it's been published, but I would imagine it's less than 3%. Any other comments? Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank with that, we'll take a little break. I think we're back here at 3.30. But um, thank you to everyone, all the presenters, and thank you to uh, our esteemed panel. And uh, good luck to everybody. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. And remember the...